As many of you would have noticed, SEBI has come out with a big consultation paper on registered investment advisors or RIAs. Uh, the idea is to ease the process of becoming an RIA and to increase the number of RIAs in India, which currently is woefully low. Um, there are about 900 or so registered RIAs. 995. 995 to be precise, you know, population of 140 crores. So to decode what's happening with uh, the whole RIA uh, regulation scenario, we have uh, Harsh Rungta who is himself an RIA and he will take us through the whys, the hows and the what might be's of, of the profession. Sure. So Harsh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you Neil for having uh, me here. Shall we start with the why? Why should anyone become an RIA? So why should you become an RIA? Let me answer that from two sides. One, I will answer why did I become an RIA? I think like most people, when I got into this side of the profession, I I had a, this nice little cozy RIA. Uh, I would charge for uh, uh, advice and then I would get commission on the mutual funds. Much before it became compulsory, I had switched to the fee, uh, completely the fee model and among other things, one thing that helped me do so was... Sorry Harsh, uh, just to break this down for our viewers. So, <clears throat> there are mutual fund distributors who take a commission on whatever funds that they are recommending. And there are RIAs who only recommend direct plans, so they can't take any commissions. So, typically they either charge a fixed flat fee or they might take a percentage which is upfront disclosed to you. Go it ahead. has to be disclosed because the client will be paying yes. it. Yes. So, I was talking about why I became an RIA uh, from being an RIA plus a distributor. Uh, and that was because of many things, but basically I, I had this very close friend of mine who was also a client uh, and I waived the fees for him because he was a friend. Uh, and I just made the commission which wasn't uh, much high, very high. And you know, uh, I realized over time as I the relationship of the professional relationship progressed that he thought he was doing me a favor <laughs> okay because he was giving me business and yeah. on which I was earning commission and I thought I was doing him a favor because I was not charging him a fees uh, and you know I said no this is not right my service is to the client okay and therefore I must take the money from the client he must know what he is paying what am I earning from him. I myself done the distribution. There is absolutely no, uh, nothing wrong with distribution. It just gave me more satisfaction to be an RIA. Let me now answer from the client's perspective. I think each of the mutual fund distributors today knows that as their clients go up the curve, given the social media noise, given all the media noise that is there, Clients are going to ask for direct plans. Clients are going to ask for these services. Having that option, even if you don't believe in it, having that option, I think is a must for any serious professional who's not doing this part time. And today, assuming the consultation paper goes through and we will talk about that a little later, corporatization will become very easy. Mm -hmm. the, the net worth requirements are being removed. And that means your ability to do both, not with the same client, but being able to offer both services is going to be there for the asking. Yeah. And I would say that every serious distributor professional should look at this option very, very seriously. Yeah. yeah. So next, uh, let's talk about how to become an RIA. Um, so first of all, I'm going to go through the list and if I miss something, Harsh, correct me. So you need to have a, uh, so first we'll discuss the current regulations and then what has been proposed. So currently you need to have a postgraduate degree in specific subjects like finance, accountancy, economics, etc. Uh, you need to pass the 10A and 10B NISM exams. And uh, you need to have for individuals a net worth of uh, one lakh uh, it's very little whatever it is uh -huh. some small net worth and for corporates 50 lakhs five zero lakhs which was a big deterrent um, and if the consultation paper is accepted then the post graduation requirement goes away 
you can be uh, a graduate but in specific areas like finance accountancy and so on um you uh, also need to still pass the nism 10a 10b exam um and the net worth also goes away so especially for corporates that's a big big deal because you suddenly go from needing to have 50 lakhs of net worth all the way down to uh, i mean it whatever it takes to float a corporate because yes. net worth requirement will be done away i think the one thing you missed uh, nail was experience oh yes sorry sorry <laughs> currently yes you need to have 5 years of experience, years of experience. Uh, in finance which will go away with the consultation paper um in terms of net worth although that will not be required you still have to deposit a sum of money with the stock exchange so i think up to 1000 clients it's 5 lakhs and more than 1000 is 10 lakhs so it's still much much lower than the current 50 lakh figure and that's for your ria clients yeah so i mean if you, as a corporate if you are doing both this deposit amount is required for ria Only clients one. if you have less than 150 ria clients then the figure is 1 lakh yeah yeah um once you have all of these things in place you have to apply to sebi for registration typically how long does it take for sebi to process an application so i think things used to be a little different uh, i think now things are pretty much uh, more st- uh, streamlined uh, of course once the new consultancy paper a uh, new consultant paper becomes effective it might take a little time to settle down but already when people are applying under the existing mm. regulations things have become much faster typically mm. it would take about 30 days i would advise people who are listening to this that we do what we are what we when i say we i am talking of the association of registered investment advisors which is a section 8 not for profit company uh, which uh, you know we have uh, formed to promote investor interests by elevating the standards of the investment advisory mm-hmm. profession if you are an ria you can become a member ria uh, aria holds what we call aria clean ria clinics uh, where a budding ria's we sort of take them through the process among them is a process to answer questions on about applications, uh, about applications. and how often are these clinics held so right now they are held on demand okay, okay. we very very happy to if if you have sufficient uh, demand from your readers we very happy to provide fantastic so you. viewers if you are interested in knowing more and engaging directly with the association uh, you can reach out uh, to aria on aria.org which is aria.org.in sorry which is the website uh, or to harsh on his personal handles or to me and i'll forward any request absolutely. to to aria absolutely um so harsh now let's talk about the life of an ria uh, in a typical year what are the regulatory compliances that you have to do so i think again uh, people think and probably rightly so that the compliance standards on rias are far more stringent than say they are on uh, other distributor. professions yeah. or distributors definitely it is much more stringent uh, but if i break it down, that down for you uh one whatever advice you give whatever clients you have you need to maintain a client register it can be the good old register where each client their details uh their kyc details every investment advice that you gave them needs to be there in a register okay it can be electronic as well i i frankly don't know a single ria who maintains <laughs> it Yeah. in the register yeah. uh, so everybody is electronic there are softwares yeah. out there the most common software is the microsoft office uh, yeah. product yeah. uh in fact harsh if we could take a step back and you know i come to you as a client what do you have to do as an ria to onboard me like what what steps does that involve so before we can take on a client we have to do a kyc right uh, we have to do a you know uh, a risk a, profile a, a risk profile we have to sign a letter of uh, engagement okay yeah. uh, which outlines all the terms and conditions and there are certain 
responsibilities that an RIA has towards the client and certain rights of the client yeah. that have to be compulsorily mentioned, yeah. uh, that have to be there in the letter of engagement. Some of them, like the fee structure, etc., have to be in the first page. Mm. So, I mean, it's a very laid down, regulated uh, service. Mm. And I think that is good both for the RIA and for the client, client as well. Yeah. Uh, so, that has to be done. Uh, once that is done, uh, then there are practical things. These are regulatory things. Mm. Then there are practical things that each client, each RIA will do depending on what they will do for the right, client. Right. If I am going to do mutual funds, maybe I will open an account with a platform. Sure. If uh, there are RIAs who do equity advice, yeah. they may uh, you open know, a DMAT account. Open, ask the client to open or they may use the client's existing DMAT account, etc. So, there could be non-regulatory things and the regulatory things is what yeah, I yeah. told you about. So, just to clarify on the non-regulatory things, the execution as it is called, RIs are not allowed to charge on that, right? Absolutely. We, we, we can assist clients with the execution. Uh, we cannot make money from the execution. Right. right. Okay. So, we discussed uh, the register and the, at the time of onboarding, the fact that there has to be a risk assessment and uh, the agreement has to be signed. Um, what else needs to be done in a year from, from an RIA's point of view? So obviously any advice needs to be suitable based on the risk profile of the clients, based on the resources, right. based on his goals. You need whatever advice you are giving needs to be suitable and that suitability needs to be captured. It is, uh, I mean, Document. whatever yeah. it needs to be documented and be available for a sure. compliance audit. Uh, so that is ongoing, yeah. right? Uh, at the end of the year, there is a compliance audit that needs to be done. This is uh, done by a CA or by... So, so if, if you are a non-individual and subject to statutory audit, uh, it had to be done by your auditor earlier. Uh, now, I think they are under the consulting consultation paper. I think it can be done by any chartered accountant. Right. Uh, it, it has to be done. If it, if it requires, if it points out certain shortcomings, then an act, uh, action taken report also needs yeah. to be adopted by the yeah, uh, yeah. board of the company, etc. Uh, and that needs to be filed with uh, BAC ASL earlier, now with Bombay Stock Exchange, which is the first line uh, regulator, regulator for uh, RIAs. Uh, also, uh, you need to file the compliance report status on your website. You also on your website need to show what is the grievance procedure. There are certain things that uh, you need to show on your website. What is the complaint status? How many complaints have come on scores? So there is again a set of things. And that if you, you don't have a website, do. how do you show this? Then you have to send it to the client. Okay. You send an email to the client. Okay. Okay. Um, but in today's day and world, I think almost everybody has, has a, a website. website. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of fees, typically how are fees charged? How often are fees charged? So the, uh, the fee structure uh, is regulated. Uh, you could charge fee under two kinds of mechanism. Uh, either you charge a fixed fee, that is maximum capped at 1,25,000. Or you could charge a fee based on the assets under advice. That is maximum two and a half percent. You cannot switch from one to the other under existing regulations. If you have charged a fixed fee, then before you switch, see, uh, uh, you know, uh, investment advisory relationship is a long term relationship mm. typically. Mm. So you cannot switch from a fixed fee to mm. variable or variable to fixed mm. within a year. Minimum 12 months have to go by. That is the existing regulations. The Under the proposed regulations, it's far more flexible. Exact shape, uh, I hmm. think we will know as but it you can comes switch up. Is the but you can switch for sure yeah. under the new regulations. Yes. And you can only charge up to two quarters of advance. What you could charge in advance is uh, two quarters. Yes. Right. Um, 
so there are many technical points with this nail which i think are a little bit too much for okay. a okay work okay i'll just i'll just <laughs> go into two more the idea is to give people the reality and the checklist that it involves uh, without scaring anyone so uh, just two more things one is that the cyber security uh, compliance has to be done could you elaborate on that so there is a i mean you have to do an awareness this is not a sebi regulation as such it's a certi it's a regulation from meti the ministry of electronics electronics uh, and you know it goes through all the regulators yeah. all regulated entities have to go through that uh, cyber awareness programs yeah. etc uh, again uh, this may sound very you also have to give a software as a service if you are using any software as a service then every 6 months there is a certain certificate uh, that you have to uh, provide again that's a and and who provides the certificate i mean how do you get it who? you provide it's self certification it's self certification and you have to, uh, you have to take it from your service <laughs> provider and provide uh, to sebi to sebi so that the data is being stored in uh, not to sebi to bse right uh, to that the data is being stored, stored in, in the india etc right right, right. and the other thing is uh, you also have to maintain records as per the pmla like how how does that compliance come in so i mean uh, obviously like any other regulated entity you are required to report any suspicious transactions uh, to the fiu uh, anything and and that's a there is a definition mm. given there i don't claim to be an expert on mm. pmla uh, PMLA, I mean, you have to do the those things, but I think typically the way we would do things is that there is a list that mm-hmm. you have against which whenever a new client comes, mm-hmm. or even all your existing client, mm-hmm. you scrub mm-hmm. them periodically against that list to mm-hmm. see that none of the proscribed individuals mm-hmm. or entities are in your client list. Right. 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 That is one thing, and now these are available as software. okay mm-hmm. uh, that is one thing uh, that you do mm-hmm. suspicious transactions uh, you have to report to mm-hmm. the FIU. financial in- intelligence unit okay any big one we have missed apart from the list that we just went through uh, not really and what i really want to add neil is that people should not get scared okay? no no i that's not my uh, intention at all <laughs> and uh, you know aria is there we are a very close knit community uh, we have a compliance calendar the community is very active and we learn from each other and we support uh, each, each other. other and finally in terms of gaps in the current consultation paper so one big gap that mint has also written about is this ambiguity around um, products which are not regulated by sebi or any other indian regulator so sebi has created essentially three categories of products one which are under sebi like mutual funds and stocks RIS can advise on that no problem charge fees and so on then there are products which are under other indian regulators like IRD or PFRDA where the RIA can provide advice uh, but they have to give clients a disclaimer that they cannot approach sebi for any grievance redress um and then there is a third category of products which is quite important to financial planning things like wills tax overseas securities where sebi has in the consultation paper said that that advice can only be delivered by a separate entity why is this a problem harsh why not have a separate entity um and you know how does this affect the work of an ri so i can give you plenty of examples i mean comprehensive financial see from a client's perspective a client does not respect regulatory boundaries client cannot be expected to know this is sebi's remit this is irda's remit this is pfrda's remit this is nobody's remit hmm. okay or this is the indian laws remit and this is the international laws hmm. remit uh, so when a client comes to you and i can give you many examples hmm. okay uh, for example you have saved up for mutual funds for hmm. your daughter's education Hmm. You, you now want to know that is it okay to take an education loan rather than hmm. liquidate hmm. right correct and if it is okay give me the working yeah okay so that's tax planning yeah 
if that working shows that it is okay to take mm. an education loan then help me get the mm. education loan now that's mm. that's not regulated mm. helping people to get a loan and getting paid for it yeah. is not regulated yeah. it's yeah. not regulated by rbi then you know i mean so you know for a client for me to tell a client that sorry i can't advise <laughs> you this is tax planning yeah. i'm not allowed to do tax planning but sorry i can't help you get the loan because this is not allowed or you go to a separate entity mm. or it is under even a different brand mm. i think that does not work it's that it's confusing way. it's very client. very confusing i'm so very clearly the regulator has shown great willingness it has been in a very consultative uh, status and position i mean we have had good dialogues with them i'm very comfortable and confident that they will agree to solution. sort of look at and find a solution they also have a issue right they have an issue that if people complained about these services they won't be able to help because they don't know about mm. those services mm. and i think that's a very genuine concern mm. for that our position from uh, you know as as an as an ria is that just like what they have proposed for a part time ria where who would be an educationist of influencer whose core activity is unregulated mm. okay mm. they have been asked in the consultation paper to give a disclaimer saying that if there is a complaint regarding that mm. you cannot come to sebi mm. we saying let's have a sep- different dis- same dispensation mm. for the full time rias RIS. as well okay okay any other issues with uh, the consultation paper so before we come to the issues i want to point to the great things that the consultation paper yes, yes. has said because otherwise it looks like we're just cribbing 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 okay i mean look at the relaxations that they have done uh, whether it is uh, qualifications mm. whether it is uh, experience they have done away with uh, the net worth compulsory corporatization has just become it's been relaxed also and corporatization itself has been made so mm. easy because of removal of uh, net worth requirements yeah. okay uh, so i mean there are plenty of good things that yeah. are there yeah. in the paper among the misses one was this mm. scope being restricted mm. a second big miss uh, is uh, this uh, you know uh, type of uh, uh, people who provide trading calls or mm. trading call providers as we mm. call them now trading call provider somebody who gives a call saying buy sell mm. futures mm. options things like that mm. now those are typically very very security oriented mm. providing in the consultation paper that if they are doing it one to one they can be an ria and if they mm. are doing it uh, one to many they will be an ra i think anything that is based on security an ra is a research analyst which is a separate license from ria ria correct so anything if the advice is based on security how can it be one to one it will have to be one to one it will be the same whether it comes to this person so, or so they should be in the ra regulations they should okay. not be in the ia regulations sure. let me put sure. it this way and anything else i would say those are so on the fee, there are lots of clarifications required on a lot of other things yeah. i would not call them a miss i am yeah. reasonably sure They I will think, agree to those clarifications. Yeah, I think there is one thing that I would bring up, uh, especially relevant for a lot of MFDs, distributors who want to become RIAs that, uh, or or RIAs whose clients already have regular plans with MFDs or banks that, if an RIA is telling you that get out of this scheme, put money in that scheme, then they should be allowed to charge a fee on the distributed. AUM as well, right? Which they are not getting the distribution commission for. Somebody else is getting the commission for. That's definitely on your list, right? So this is a clarification, I yeah. think, and uh, this is something we have sought, and I'm, I mean, we hope that we will get that clarification. Yeah. All right, uh, Harsh, thank you so much. Hopefully, people watching this uh, will some of them approach you, approach Arya, and we'll have an uptick in the numbers. I just want to end this with saying the great support that uh, you know you personally and you know Livemint has provided to the profession 
and to those who are watching i can say this is a very satisfying profession do not go by what you have heard okay it is never as difficult as it is said it is never as easy as you think <laughs> fair enough thank you harsh thank you